Gary Hopper has said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I have passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown of God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined the lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And as even some of your own poets have said, we are indeed his offspring. Think then of our offspring. We ought not to think that the divine beings like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, Who will hear you again about this? So Paul went out from their midst. From their midst. But some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him.
because of uh, that naughty man, David Vance, have heard about uh, symbiosis. And symbiosis is really a child of global interaction. Without global interactions, input symbiosis would never have started. And uh, uh, I, uh, we've got a, a fundraising breakfast on the 19th of March. If you're really interested in a great breakfast, and uh, you'll hear about symbiosis at that breakfast. Because we try to raise funds for all the projects of symbiosis, not only from churches, but also from people outside. Because uh, many people outside churches uh, uh, can respond to the sort of work that symbiosis does. But what I want to talk with you this morning about is that it's only the communities of faith in Jesus Christ who will support and uh, pray for uh, that which is the greatest thing of humanity, which is Jesus. It's only churches who will do that, or communities of faith. Now, you might, if you hang around Morris Lee long enough, you'll find that I don't talk about church that much. I talk about community of faith. Because uh, church is so full of uh, different ideas. We have a building in Bangladesh called the Friendship Tower, named by a uh, good friend of mine, a Bangladeshi called the Friendship Tower. It's surrounded on three sides by the Catholic mission. And uh, I go, I take people when they come to Bangladesh, I take them to the roof of our building and I say, now look for the religious symbols around here. And so they look around and they pick out crosses. And in the cross, the cross sits in the middle of an M. And I say, now you look. And I say, now what's that M stand for? Sponsored by McDonald's? Nine and C? No. Sense for Mary. Sense for Mary. And the major institutional representation of Christianity within a country like Bangladesh and many others gives an impression of following Christ uh, that is very different from the Bible. Because they, uh, that uh, you have in that institutional representation, if you go inside the sanctuary or the church or whatever, you'll find lots of statues. The only other place within the town of Mimonsen where you will find religious statues that are in Hindu temples. But Bangladesh is 88% Muslim. And if you go into a Muslim place of worship, if you shifted the chairs from out of this building and we all sat on the floor, that's what you find. No religious symbols whatsoever. So, yeah, anyway, uh, I love geometry. Uh, I love geometry. One of my favourite aspects of geometry is tangents. So I'm often going to love it. Anyway, uh, that uh, seven, 7 billion people in the world today. 7 million, two thirds of them are basically unmarried. That is, they have no chance of hearing about what God has done for them in Jesus in a way that they can A, understand, B, see as relevant to their life, and C, then accept in a way that they can live it out. Now, uh, uh, okay. Now, this is an interesting thing. If you put the 7 billion people who are in the world today into Australia, there would be 3,100 people per square mile. Sorry for those who are under the age of 55, if you don't understand what the square mile is, uh, but the, you know, I'm using the old. Uh, there'd be 3,100 people per square mile. The present population density of Bangladesh is 3,600 people per square mile. So, uh, I have a friend of mine, he's an American, I worked with him for uh, 39 years, and uh, 
he, this, he said Bangladesh is one definition of cozy. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but it's to the unreached people of the world that we seek to go. And not only in Bangladesh, uh, but in places like Kazakhstan, in Malawi, and Mozambique, in three uh, people groups in Indonesia, and amongst Buddhist people in, uh, in uh, Thailand, and Cambodia, and amongst the minority Muslim groups in China. Those uh, are focus. My focus has been, along with the team that I work with, is to be the Muslim people of Bangladesh. Bangladesh has a, a, a Christian church. It has an amazing church amongst tribal groups. Now, uh, Warwick's father uh, worked amongst the tribal group, amongst the Garo people. And the Garo people are amazing. That uh, over a period from the la uh, latter part of the uh, 19th century through the early part of the 20th century, the Garo tribe basically came to Christ. I've been, as I say, in Bangladesh for nearly 39 years, and uh, about three years ago, uh, I, I had the opportunity to go over the border into India, into the state of Meghalaya, uh, which is uh, one of the states of India, uh, just above Bangladesh. I stood in Bangladesh, which is the plains, the Bengal plains. Uh, uh, Bangladesh makes a, uh, a billiard table look lumpy. Uh, it's flat. It's, it's just a, an alluvial plain. But you come to the north of Bangladesh, in north of Mind and Singh district, where Dave is at the moment, and uh, you look up and there's these hills. And they just rise up suddenly. And then they, they become Assam, and then it goes on to go a couple hundred kilometres, and then it comes the Mother of All Mountains, the Himalayas. And I had never been to uh, this part of the world. I have never been up to those mountains that I have been staring at for over 35 years. And so I got the opportunity. Uh, it took uh, uh, just a little border crossing, went over into the Megalite. And that was fascinating. Because I rocked up to this border crossing, just uh, near Joram Pura Hospital, where Dave uh, Leslie, uh, where our fisheries is located. And I came up to this uh, border crossing. So here's a couple of uh, uh, local policemen. And they were amazed. He is a foreigner. I have to tell them which form that I have to fill out. <laughs> Took about an hour, because they kept giving me the wrong form. And I said, well, listen, fellows, fellows, this is all in Bengali. No, I think that's the wrong one. Oh, no, no, this is the fault. No, and, look, and then I said, look, show me your book. So they showed me the book. And I said, look, here, here, here it is. Oh, and I said, I don't want to get you in trouble. Mind you, I was very selfish. I was worried. And when I rocked up to the international airport, and they had the wrong sort of uh, form for that, then I'd get in trouble. So I never told them that. I just, I just want to save you guys. And uh, so I crossed the border. I travelled for two hours and I was amazed at the difference geographically, top, uh, topographically and socially. And I went to a church and I went to a Garo church and uh, on the Sunday when I walked in, it was a big new building, had a mezzanine floor. When I walked in, about a hundred people sat down at the front, the service started about 20 minutes into the service, uh, they recognised there was a foreigner there, they brought me up, turned me around, it was full. There must have been 1,500 to 2,000 people there. And, uh, so, so it was all in Gara, went for three hours, and if you wanted to lose weight, it was a great place. Because it was not only a Baptist church, it was a sauna. And uh, it was led by a woman, because in uh, Gara society, the matriarch, the woman preached, uh, another woman preached, she was a medical doctor, gave uh, an hour's sermon on uh, a biblical view of abortion. And uh, I could understand the whole thing, despite the fact that it was in Garo, because the PowerPoint was in English. <laughs> and, uh, but it was just the same as a um, as a Western service. There were guitars, there was PowerPoints. It, it was just amazing. But I was emotionally moved. 
I sat down after I, uh, after being briefed, I sat down and, and uh, tears came into my eyes. And I thought, this is amazing. Here is this whole tribal group who through uh, Australian Baptist missionaries largely uh, have come to faith in Christ. A whole lot. And I thought, I've looked at the website to say, 
uh, what mistakes have I made? And where are our weaknesses? Because that's more honest. We just want to put the positive spin on stuff. But you see, it's through your mistakes, what you try, and where you fail, and what problems occur, that those are your biggest learning things. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I met someone the other day, and they said, oh, you're still in Bangladesh. I said, yep. And the reason is because uh, I don't believe God has told me when I tell them it's finished. And that if we expect to see people uh, respond out of a huge people group, the single largest ethnic group of Muslims in the world are the Bengali Muslims, amongst whom God has given me and the team that I work with, the British group. The single largest ethnic group of Muslims. Now, uh, Jesus said, As the Father has sent me, so send I you. Well, how was Jesus sent? Well, we can't come that way, but. Uh, uh, Galatians chapter 4 says that he was born of a woman, born under the law. That is, that Jesus was within a particular society and culture. As I read the Gospels, I'm constantly uh, encouraged, I'm constantly challenged by uh, how Jesus lived. It is just amazing. It is so profound that God sent Jesus into the world. Now, particularly Luke's Gospel. Luke's Gospel has more about uh, uh, the few references to Jesus' early life. So, you know, he's born, uh, you find references to the wise men coming when he's, uh, uh, after he's born, uh, the uh, uh, those amazing uh, nativity scenes. But in Luke's Gospel, it has Jesus at the age of 12 going to Jerusalem, probably for the first time from Galilee. Now, Galilee uh, is uh, at three days' walk. So they walk down. The whole village probably walks down. He's 12 because it's a significant time in his life. Now, is they're there. They finish the feast. And then they all start to go back. And then it says that Mary and Joseph, after they've been walking for a day, realised that Jesus wasn't with them. And nowadays they probably be up on a charge of, uh, of, uh, of the abuse of the child. <laughs> but you see, in a communal society, they would just assume he's with everyone. He's with his relatives, he's with the friends, all the ones who've come. But at the end of the day, they're not there. They go back to Jerusalem. Three days they're looking for him. <coughs> Could you imagine Mary's uh, distress, Joseph's distress, <coughs> at not finding him? And then, where do they find him? He's <coughs> in the temple. He's in the temple, and he's talking to the uh, leaders of, of the religious leaders. And they're amazed at this 12-year-old boy, the questions he's asking, the responses he's given. And Mary says, your father and I were beside ourselves. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, what are you looking for? Don't you know that I need to be about my, I need to be in my father's house? <laughs> That's a 12 year old. Hey, when I was 12, in the summer it was cricket, and in the winter it was soccer. I know. Though so, uh, anything else in between was irrelevant. That Jesus is there as a 12 year old boy, and they're amazed at it. The leaders of that society, the intellectuals of that society, were amazed at this 12 year old village boy. But then it says that he submitted to them and he went with them. In Luke's Gospel it says that he grew in, uh, he grew in wisdom. 
He grew in favor with God and man. Okay, so there's Jesus. And then for whatever, it says that Luke's Gospel says that when he was about 30, then he began his uh, public ministry. says that God is interested. God is, is uh, when he wants to communicate, he communicates through our language and our culture. That's just astonishing. Uh, we find another example. And the other example is after Jesus is the communication of the message of Jesus to people who were not of a Jewish background. Now, uh, uh, we have read to us from uh, Acts, uh, uh, the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17. And it's an amazing message. It's probably the most significant uh, text in the Bible of how to share the message with people who don't have some sort of biblical background. That is, those who didn't know if you'd have said to them, Isaiah 53 says this, and they would have went, Isaiah. Isaiah, doesn't he run a grocery shop down on the Jewish block? <laughs> no. Because they didn't know the Bible. So this is the most complete passage in the whole of the Bible about how to reach out uh, to uh, about how to communicate with people who don't have a biblical background. See, Jesus came right into his society. That, that's just astonishing. Jesus, the Word of God, took upon a particular, who came into this world, born of Mary, lived in a particular society, preached in that society, and then said to his disciples, you are to go to all the ethnic groups of the world. Here, in Acts chapter 17, we find the best example in the whole of the Bible about how to share with people who don't have a biblical background. So what do we find? Well, it's an amazing passage. Uh, I put up there on the slide. Uh, that is the actual place, probably, where Paul stood. It's called the Areopagus. It's in Athens. And uh, there's a plaque there. Uh, one day, if I ever get a chance, uh, I'd like to go there and see that plaque and stand there where Paul stood and share that message that was read to us from, this, from uh, that has now become part of our scripture. And how he shared with people who didn't have a biblical background. Well, it's an amazing passage because uh, he uh, takes that which they knew and he started with that which they knew so when you uh, find him they said to him, look what's this guy he's, he, he, he's preaching about foreign gods and when he stands up to uh, speak to them and he wasn't afraid he was not afraid to interact with people of a completely uh, non-faith background he wasn't afraid now sometimes I think uh, that uh, uh, within the Christian church we become afraid to get out to, uh, to share with people outside of the, the, the meeting halls of uh, the Christian church. To get out there where people are. Before I went to Bangladesh I used to do, used to do a little bit of work with a, a group called Open Air Campaigns. I'm not sure whether they're around but so I used to go into uh, the center of the city and stand with them and preach. Uh, boy that was an experience. Uh, it was lots of fun. Uh, but uh, uh, you know <laughs> Paul was someone who wasn't afraid to get out there. To get out there where the people are and to relate to them in ways that they could understand. Uh, the passage that was read to us, as he, was in, he saw around them and he was disturbed by what they were seeking to worship. And so he began to share both in the Jewish synagogues, which was his starting point, and in the marketplace. 
And then uh, they invited him to uh, this this uh, place where they would debate the Areopagus. You can go there if you ever get the chance to go to Athens. And there is this brass plaque with this passage uh, that was read out to us. And so he starts in this way. He says, "People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious." He starts in a positive way. You see, uh, God has not left any culture without a witness. We need to start with that which is positive within the culture of people. And uh, uh, so that he, uh, he, he un unloads for them. He unpacks for them what this means. This passage is the most amazing uh, passage. He doesn't uh, refer to Isaiah or Ezekiel or anything, but he makes a wonderful summary of what the Old Testament is about. It's a beautiful summary. And then he takes what they know and that what they know, where it uh, agrees with the biblical revelation, he takes that and uses it. Quotes from a couple of their poets. Epimenides the Greek. Now I'm sure you read that. Uh, in your spare time, if you don't read that, then it's Arrakis. Uh, he, he, he speaks from two Greek poets, and they're, and they're quoted in verse 28. In him we live and move and have our being. We are indeed his offspring. Those are from Greek poets, and they've been included now in our scripture. They agree with what the Old Testament uh, 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 revealed. And so uh, he then presents to them that, uh, uh, that we ought not to think that God is, uh, is like gold or silver or stone, a representation by the art and imagination of human beings. The times of ignorance God has overlooked. Now he commands all people everywhere to repent. And you see... As you read this passage, you find that uh, Paul had a wonderful knowledge of the Bible. He had such a knowledge of the Bible that he was able to summarize it and put it into uh, a way that non-biblical uh, people who didn't read the Bible would understand. So he had a great knowledge of the Bible. Uh, the, third, the second thing was they had a knowledge of his own culture. He knew from where he came. So that's very important. Really, really important to know where we come from. You know, uh, if you do geometry or trigonometry, one of the geometries, that uh, if you really want to know where you are, you have to triangulate. You have to figure out a couple of reference points. And this is what Paul does. He knows where he comes from, and then he knows their own culture. He knows their culture. He quotes their poets. I grew up, when I was growing up in the 50s and the early 60s in Brisbane, uh, there were Sunday schools were absolutely chock a block. All the kids, all the baby boomer kids, put your hands up if you're a bona fide guard carrying guard, baby boomer. Come on, come on. Yeah, look at them. Yeah. Okay. There were Sunday schools were just chock a block. Because even though parents may not have gone to church, they sent their kids to Sunday school. And so we learn uh, Bible stories. We learn uh, we absorb that stuff. Now you go uh, that's not the case today. Yesterday in Australia, uh, there's a story which uh, I believe to be true. Uh, a fellow from Melbourne, he worked for a university, he used to go to Bangladesh and do social research work. And uh, anyway, uh, he went there several times. He ended up marrying a girl from the Christian community in Bangladesh. So there's a small Christian community. 
So he married a girl from there, he took her back to Melbourne. Now he was a great Aussie rule for kind of, it was his great passion. And so he took his new wife along to watch Aussie rules. And then to help her, he bought her a book about the players. And uh, gave her this book. And so she's reading the book. And then as she's reading it, she says to him, Where's Jesus? And he says, What do you mean, where's Jesus? He is gifted for this task. He knew 
what these people were interested in. He knew that for them, their, their uh, philosophic background, their culture believed that the body was evil. And here's this foolish Jew getting up and saying, a man has risen from the dead. Well, you know, that's so crazy. That's why some of them wanted to hear him again. Others thought, oh, fool. He's an absolute fool. Friends, today in, in Australia, if you uh, get up publicly and say, I oh, know, uh, I believe in God, and I believe that God created the world, and that uh, He sent Jesus into this world uh, to redeem humanity, then I claim it. Or you're a fool. Really, uh, that uh, the second law of thermodynamics says that everything goes from the complex to the simple. But if you listen to what the world says, it goes from the simple to the complex. Whereas the second law of thermodynamics of physics says the opposite. The Bible and the second law of thermodynamics are at one. It's the world and it's that wants to believe that we came out of nothing, I like to say this, uh, it's really intelligent to believe that intelligence comes from non-intelligence. That's really intelligent. <laughs> so that the way that all uh, works here with these people has lessons for us today, has lessons for us in Bangladesh. We start where people are, people who are Muslim people, who believe in God, who believe in an all-powerful God. So we can start there. They have the Quran, which talks about, uh, has more references to Jesus than any other prophet. That's where we start. The most fruitful uh, evangelists among Muslim people in Bangladesh start there. And they have led many people, hundreds of people, to faith in Jesus. Now, uh, <laughs> the, the thing is that Paul then says, God has fixed the day on which he will judge the world rightly by a man that he's raised from the dead. Now, I don't know whether you noticed it, but you see in this passage, Paul never refers to the name of Jesus. Which is amazing. He says he's raised a man from the dead. Now, you have to see that this is an introductory, um, an introductory time with these people. Paul was my like me, I won't teach the whole Bible in one hour and a half. You'll be out here before then, folks. Uh, you see that that uh, he takes, he takes, he puts it out there that God has raised a man from the dead. Uh, that's what he spoke about. Believe in the fairies to think that this could happen. No, 
I've got a few questions that I like to put to people uh, if they think about that. I, here's a common question, here's a question that I like to ask people. How many here know the name of their maternal grandmother to the eighth generation? <laughs> Granny, that 